kind of meetings, especially now. And uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, okay. So the title of my talk is, is Miconia as a Keystone Reso Plant Resources for Neotropical Frugivores. And as I said, I, as a disclaimer, I'm not really a Melstone guy, but my research is mostly hypothesis oriented. So we use Melstone because this is an amazing group of plants. I don't have to explain that to you as a, a way of testing our hypothesis. So to go on resources for frugivores, how to use frugivores. Yes, okay. So the second part, in the first part, I'll show you that Miconia is by far an important resource for neotropical frugivores. And then the second part, I will explain why they are so important. And then in the end, of the talk, I want to propose a network, a collaborative network, to build a global database on Melastone functional traits. And I would like to invite everyone interested to stay here after, after the talk. Okay? So let's go. Okay, so I want to introduce the concept of keystone species. This is Robert Payne. So more than 50 years ago, he coined the idea of keystone species. This is one of the most powerful and popular concepts in ecology since then. So basically what he did is he experimentally removed this top predator in the shores in, uh, in Western US, the Pisaster opossum. And after he removed the starfish, the ecosystem changed dramatically, the California mussel population exploded, and there was drastic changes in the community and the ecosystems. So inspired by the concept of, the, of this arc, this small stone here is under the least pressure, but if you remove it, the whole arc collapses. And then he created the concept of keystone species. So that's our species that have a disproportionately high impact on the communities relative to their boundaries. And traditionally, since 50 years ago, examples of keystone species include mainly top predators, but also some big mammals in the land, in the sea. And those are traditionally being viewed as species that have very high conservation value because if you remove them from the communities, the whole communities will collapse. But then after a few decades, the concept of keystone species have been uh, widened, have been discussed and evolved. So one of the two, basically to comprise uh, other species uh, that are not really top predators. So beavers, for example, they have keystone effects on communities through non-food web effects. So build different structures, and this results in uh, uh, dramatic changes in the, in the communities. So uh, the keystone species are those whose effects are large and disproportionately large relative to its abundance. So in order to comprise plants as keystone species, the concept has been redefined and there have been, in the past decades, several attempts to identify keystone resources for frugivores. So mistletoes, figs, cecropia, and even melastones have been proposed to be keystone species because those species, they sustain a large and a wide diversity of frugivores. This, this, these papers are really good, very informative. They set the basic stones for the for identification of keystone species, but there's a problem here because all these species, all these studies, they have a local limitation and temporal limitation. So most of them are related to people going to the, to the environment, observing frugivores eating fruits, and then for a limited uh, part of the year, a limited region, and then uh, you have no idea on how these uh, plants compare to each other because they generally focus on a given group. So in order to find broad scales of keystone species, we need a different approach. And what we did in the studies are to uh, use fruit frugivore networks trying to assess the role of uh, 
new, new tropical keystone species. So one way that, the only way that we can assess the role of keystone species is to remove them from the ecosystem or to include them in the ecosystems and observe the cascading effects on the community stability and diversity. Doing that is nowadays is kind of unethical. You cannot go to the woods and try to kill all the elephants and see what happens to a given community or kill all the lions or, or jaguars. So one way that we can really assess the role of keystone species is doing uh, simulated species removal from networks. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, ecological networks. This basic representation of how plants, the, the squares interact with frugivores, the squares. So every time you, you see a bird or a frugivore eating a fruit, then that's a positive interaction, then you score one. And when the, this interaction is not present, then you score zero. So you can imagine that if you remove this kind of plant here from the community, you have a much larger effect on the community than you, when compared to the removal of these species which interact with only one frugivore. So we, have, we hypothesize that keystone species in the networks promote community stability. Then if we remove them, this will result in higher change in the network structure, then uh, higher than compared than expected by chance. So what we did here is to assemble 38 fruit frugivore networks across the neotropics. You can see here that we sample from almost the the, the Tropic of Capricorn to the Cancer, including Galapagos on islands from, from the sea level to the Andes in, uh, in Western uh, and South America. We have more than 6,000 interactions, almost 1,200 1, species of plants across a wide diversity of families. And we included 31 networks from forests and seven from open ecosystems. So we basically cover the wide diversity of ecosystems and uh, geographic locations in South America. And we have to develop a new approach to identify these keystone uh, resources. So what we did here, we have this map that represents the interactions between birds on the, on the column plants on the rows. So every time you see one is an interaction that has been observed and zero is an interaction that was not observed. So we had 38 matrix of these ones and we calculated simple matrix here, what, we, what are called normalized degree, centralized uh, centrality and between the centrality. For those who are not familiar with these terms, this, these are basic uh, descriptors of the network who inform which species are more connected. So the higher values of each of these three metrics here show which are species are more connected in the network. So for each of these three metrics, we calculated the, the first quartile, so the top ones which have this centrality measures here, those species that are more connected in the network. And then for each individual uh, uh, metrics, so centralize it, centrality, normalize the degree, and between a degree, we just made a threshold, a cut, and then we selected the 10 top for each one of them. And then the final step was overlapping all those three metrics. And the species that, uh, I mean, the genus or the genera that overlap into these three metrics would be identified or retrieved as the potential keystone plants resources. So I will show the first results here. As you can see for the three metrics, Mekon is by far the most important resource for frugivores here. So Cecropia and Ficus are often shown even in textbooks to be important keystone resources for neotropical and even paleotropical fauna here. But then as you can see Meconia wins by some orders of magnitude here. And when we overlap all those three criteria, aha, then Myconia is, as you would expect, the top one. So from the 108 families that we have here with a lot of genera, we have only six genera which have been retrieved as 
keystone resource. So at the general that that are the top 10 across those three criteria here. So Myconia, Cicopia, Fico, Cicopia, Clusia, and Bussonia. Some of those have never been argued to be keystone resources before. So, and then this, our second approach was to, uh, to evaluate the effects of removal simulations on the network properties. So as I told before, we cannot go to the field and remove the species. So what we can do is simulate their removal in the networks. And we tested the effect of removal on three metrics, nestedness, modularity, and niche overlap. So niche, uh, so nestedness is a property of networks where uh, less connected species are just a subset of the more connected species. So, in, in, so you can see the bird species here, you can see the, the plant species here. We even found a clip art of Meconia to use here. And we uh, hypothesized that the keystone species are shown here in red, would have uh, higher nestedness, they would have higher modularity, and then the niche overlap here. So this is just a graphic representation of a network, a nested network would look like. This is a representation of a modular network. Modularity is just a property of the networks which we have some subgroups of species which interact with, with, within their group more than species from the group. And then niche overlap are species that connect different species, but they, they, they have overlap with other species as well. And this is a graphic representation. So what we did here is we moved some melastomes, so observed the effect of nestedness or modularity and niche overlap, and then we have removed randomly some other species from the network to compare the effects of the micronia removal, not only micronia, but the six genera, and then random removal of other species. We selected nestedness, modularity, and niche overlap because these have been shown as surrogates of community stability, resistance to disturbance, and species loss. So changes in nestedness, nestedness modularity, and niche overlap would mean that species, that the communities are more prone to uh, destabilization. And this is basically what we found here. So we have the six genera for nestedness, modularity, and niche overlap. And we have here the removal of each of these genera, the effect of removal on the on the nestedness and the removal of uh, random species. That's our new model. And then I highlighted here, you don't have to read all the table, but we can see the, the for the six genera, for nestedness, modularity, and niche overlap, we have a statistical value here shown in bold, and I put the red arrow to indicate where you have significant effects. And as you can see, as a general, when you remove Miconia from a community, then you have a significant uh, decrease in, in nastiness, but for other genera, except Cecropia, this does not exist. So for Meconia and Cecropia, yes, when you remove them from the communities, nastiness, nastiness change from modularity, only the removal of Meconia was significant. And for niche overlap, okay, for Meconia, Cecropia and Gersonima, when we move those species, the, the niche overlap changes. There is a decrease in niche overlap. So basically what we show here is that across all metrics, Miconia stands out as the most important uh, species creating community stability and uh, resilience to disturbances. This is I, it's more complex than that, but basically uh, I don't want to show the details. This paper has just been published last month in Biotropica. And all the credits go to João, who's here in the room, and Tadeu, and Wesley from Mexico as well. So this guy, he is, was his master thesis. He's a brilliant student. He's now a PhD student at the Pennsylvania State University. And you will hear more about João in a minute, okay? So now that we show that Miconia is really the most important group of plants sustaining frugivores across the neotropics, we wanted to know why they are so important. So we have reviewed the natural history of Meconium. It's a big group, you all know that. 
And then we try to get the functional traits that are related to keystoneness of meconia. So in order to do that, we, compa we compile data from fruit traits and fruit in phenology. We integrated the scatter information on frugivory in meconia to provide the first assessment of the number of uh, animals that eat meconia fruits. And I think you'll be surprised to hear that. And we also, and we finally, we, we evaluated the effects of gut passage on the germination of meconia species using meta-analysis. Meta so we have a data set of, for fruit trace of 360 species for fruit in phenology, a different species. As you can see here, the number of species is different for different traits because this information is really scattered in the literature. So it's just like mining all the data from the literature is really time consuming. And all the credits again go to João for doing that. And we have data spread across the neotropics, more sites than we have for the networks. But you can, as you can see here, our data set is far from being complete. And for that person, we have 35 species. Okay, so this is a rose diagram showing the number of Mekonia species fruiting every month in the neotropics. So this is January, February, and so on. So this is the result of statistical tests, which tests whether the distribution is different from random. As you can see, the p-values are, are non-significant. This means that the plants are fruiting year-round across the neotropics. So this shows that Meconia species fruit all over the year. But of course, you have to go into different communities and look what's going on there. And in the neotropics, we have this moist habitats, the seasonal ecosystems, and we have the, drip, the seasonal habitat, seasonal habitats where there's some period of the year where it doesn't rain too much. So this is a, just one example of a seasonal ecosystem where there's the dry season here. As you can see, air, no matter when you go to the field, there will always be one kind, one species of meconia fruiting. No matter when, there will always be some meconia fruiting. And if you go to a, a seasonal ecosystem, you also see that doesn't matter when you go there, there will always be some meconia fruiting as well. So meconias fruit year round on the neotrop. If you are a frugivore, especially if you are a frugivore bird, you always can rely on meconia for food. So this is the histogram showing the distribution of different fruit traits of meconia. And just to sum up here, meconia fruits are small, as we all know. They are, the seeds are also small, although there is some variation. And there are kind of large number of seeds per fruit, but this is really outstanding. And the fruit crop size of meconia is something that's almost unbelievable hundreds of thousands of species of fruits in a single individual tree. So this is an, another point that makes meconia reliable for fruit growth. So small fruits, which have uh, high content of water and sugar, which is, makes it, them very easy to digest, and they are produced in high amounts. So fruit growth can really rely on these resources. Half of the meconia fruits are black, but also purple and dark. As you can see here, there is a wide diversity, but those are the main um, frugivores. And early studies back in the 90s by people studying in, in the Central America by Julie Denslow, that these meconia fruits are basically bird dispersed. But as we can see here, and studies have shown uh, in the last, in the past decade, many other frugivores also rely on melastoma frugivores. As you can see here, birds, they can eat all kinds of colors and mammals as well, but the reptiles, they kind of prefer purple fruits. We don't know if it's a pattern because this, the sample size here is really small, but it seems that it, Lizards and turtles, they prefer turtle, purple fruits. 
ants also don't care about food pollen, so we all foods that fall to the ground um, in the savannas, in the forest, they can be removed by ants, no matter what color they are. And that's what we did. So we want to estimate the diversity of frugivores eating corn and food. So this is basically a red fraction curve showing the number of species that consume they consume uh, micronic fruits, and this on the x-axis is the number of uh, studies of micronic species. So we can calculate and estimate the number of species that can eat fruits uh, using this as uh, sampling units, and you can see the shadows are confidence intervals. And you can see the, the, the small micronic studies are the species richness increases for birds, increases for ants, for primates or mammals, lizards, and even fish. This is insect here is just a highlight of this minute part here of the bracket. As you can see, the, the none of the curves stabilize the rich um, acid. So this means that diversity of food was is still underestimated. We found 600 and almost 50 species of animals consuming micronic fruits, but this is certainly an underestimation because the shape of, so if you add more species, the curves will keep growing. And this is unbelievable for me. If you look at Miconia albicans, this is my favorite plant, 122 species of animals consume its fruits. This is really outstanding. I don't know if any of you would know 122 bird names, but this Mikonia albicans is consumed by all of these plants. And you can see here, this is a widespread species, so it has the opportunity to be in contact with different uh, frugivores. And this is Mikonia ipoleuca, the first species that has been argued to be a keystone resource in the, in the Atlantic forest. But this is just a opportunistic study where uh, researchers have counted the number of birds eating its fruits when a gap open and then the plant fruited. So there is a very limited uh, temporal assessment here as well. But then you can see lots of birds also, they don't care about which meconia, they eat lots of meconians as well. And this is really uh, a little bit strange because it has been argued that some fruit, especially green fruits, are not visited by a high number of birds because the role of green fruits is to photosynthesize. And this has been shown 40 years ago. And, but this Miconia albicans produ is, produces green fruits and is the most consumed plant species probably in the world. And lastly, we found, we aim it at understanding the effect of gut passage not only gut passage, but manipulation by ants across different groups of vertebrates and invertebrates on the seed germination. And we did this using meta-analysis. So, this dashed line here is uh, showing where there is no effect on the gut passage. If you, if you go with move to the right side, this shows a positive effect, a proportional change relative to the control. So values around here means that germination increases by 100%. And if we move to the left side, values around here show that germination decreased by 100%. These are the confidence intervals. And if they overlap with the dashed line, this means no significant effects. So we had enough data to compare uh, manipulation by ants and gut passage by rodents, Gideophimorphia, that's possums, uh, primates, and birds. We have detail on different uh, families and taxa within this group, so, but I'm just going to show you a general pattern here. And when ants, they collect and if meconia fruits fall into the ground, they decrease germination significantly by almost 100%. No significant effects by rodents. A really surprise is that a really positive increase by possums, a decrease by primates and birds as well. Birds was really a surprise to us because melastones have been known for decades to be bird dispersive fruits, 
So we expected that coevolution might lead to positive effects, but birds actually decrease seed germination in the permits. This is something really unexpected. And the explanation for that is that, I mean, our explanation for that is that if you can look at the percentage of germination across different groups here, we have to compare not only with the uh, hand extracted seeds, but we also need to include this additional treatment, which is germination within the fruits. So when fruits are not eaten in nature, there's no one to remove them. There's no one to remove the seeds from the fruits. So they remain there and they don't, rem they don't germinate within the fruits. Firstly, because Mikonia fruits, they have germinate, uh, germination inhibitors in the fruit pool. They prevent germination. They also have light demanding seeds. So if they are within the fruits, light cannot reach the seeds and they won't germinate. And the fruits are basically water and sugar. If they are not consumed by frugivores, they will rot, they will be attacked by fungi and fungi will kill the seeds. In the laboratory, people extract the seeds and really set them to germinate. And then that would be a more honest comparison or more reliable comparison with the effect of different frugivores or seed dispersers. And then as you can see here, if we compare the germination of hand extracted seeds with, the, with that of different frugivores, then you can see that birds and primates are not doing that bad because the main service provided by these frugivores is not scarification of the seed tester, but rather seed cleaning is the removal of the pulp from the seeds and dispersal away from the, mo from the mother plants. And still, the ants, they provide a less significant uh, service, but if you compare the, the germination of ant manipulated seeds with that from seeds within intact fruits, you can see that ants still provide reliable and positive uh, services. So to conclude my talk, I would like to say that Mikonia is a, is a key or top keystone resources for neotropical frugivores. Its fruits are small, water and sugar rich and available year round, so they are a reliable source of diversity of food for spanning basically all lineages of vertebrates, excluding the amphibians. So the gut passages are still not clear, maybe hard to explain, but the main service it provides by frugivores is the seed cleaning or the pulping and the movement of seeds away from the parent plants where they can find safe sites for establishment. And we predict that Meconia fruits will be even more important for neotropical frugivores in a deformated and fragmented uh, forest in the future. So we are experiencing uh, uh, a significant forest fragmentation and habitat fragmentation. So you all know that Meconia species tend to be pioneers. They tend to do well in degraded ecosystems in fragmented sites in forest borders and road edges. And we are also expecting, we're also experiencing uh, significant decreases in the size of seed dispersals and in the size of fruits in neotropical forests. Uh, defalnation has resulted in the, in the killing of the large-bodied uh, frugivores and seed dispersals and the killing also in their associated large uh, fruit, large species with large seeds. So the species with large seeds are decreasing with, together with the decrease of uh, large species of frugivores. So I would like to thank very much João and Tadeu. They deserve most of the credit for this, but also I would like to thank Wesley for being an author in the, in the second, in the first paper. And my best friend, Tatiana, I think she's also here. And Lika, my former students, they have been involved in the second paper, which is now in Annals of Botany, in minor review. So we, I think we are almost there. And those people, this wonderful team is basically responsible for all the credits in this presentation here. With that, I would like to thank everyone for the presence, the, the form agencies, 
a gangster group who supports me a lot. And I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. And after that, I will be very pleased if we can discuss the idea on the trade database. Thank you very much, everyone. Nice. Fernando, thank you for the amazing talk. All this information about Miconia is really interesting. So uh, let's start with the questions. Um, there's one here, Virginia Paixão. Uh, uh, she's asking, uh, all those animals offer primary seed dispersal service or are you considering also when fruits are consumed in the ground? So in the, in the second paper, I suppose, uh, we consider both primary and secondary seed dispersers. So we, we sample data, but as you can see, one of my pitches, even ants, which are known to be secondary seed dispersers, they can be primary seed dispersers as well. I showed a picture where an uh, apple, the, it climbs, to the to Miconia becomes shrub and removes the fruit. So it's a primary seed dispersal. But in this, this paper, we have uh, considered all primary and secondary seed dispersals as well. So we sum up everything to, to provide a broad overview of the total number of seed dispersals. Okay. So we have another one, Agnes. Uh, is there any work being done on the impact of different fruit dispersers or diversification in Myconia? Not that I know of. I know that there's a recent paper, I think by Marcelo Reginato and colleagues, I suppose he also is here, he can speak better than I, showing that, attempting to show whether Miconia fruits are, have been in a key innovation for the diversification on the, on the play, but I think they didn't find any significant results showing that to the idea that Miconia, these small berries are a key innovation. Not that I know of, in Agnes. So there has been some studies showing that defoundation can lead to changes in fruit traits, and this could be related to changes in diversification but most of these studies are concentrated in palms, which have been argued to be keystone resources as well, but not on a neotropical scale according to, to our results. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another one uh, from Julie Denslow. Uh, I wonder how interchangeable fruit resources are in tropical forest. If a frugivorous birds consume a wide vari variety of fruits in different families, shouldn't the keystone resource, resource be small sugar fruits rather than particular taxonomic groups? Uh, good question, Julie. And thanks for inspiring our research on the, on the seed dispersing melastomes. So yes, we, we had as I showed in the paper, we had 108 families. Other families as well should also produce water and sugar uh, rich fruits, but they were not retrieved as important keystones resources on a, on a neotropical scale. I think it's important to mention that our first study identified keystones on the neotropical scale, on a continental scale. This doesn't mean that other groups of plants are not keystone species on a community level. So we're not saying that palms and cecropia and ficus and other small berries are not important for frugivores. They are on a community level, but perhaps on a neotropical scale, when you look across the continent, they're not as important as assumed to be uh, previously. So that would be my, my answer to you. To this question. I don't know if it's enough to me. Thanks, Fernanda. So Agnes has another question. So do you see any ecosystem part pattern? Uh, for example, are my coney fruits more abundant import or important in lowland hand oh sorry um, important in lowland rainforest than the high elevations? Uh, amazing, amazing question, Agnes. We, we have done, uh, we have included elevation 
and latitude in our models in the first, uh, you know, first study to see whether the relative importance of the different keystone genera changes with latitude and elevation. And we have found, and we were happy to find non-significant results for all results. This is when you're happy to find non-significant results. And this shows that uh, across the whole latitudinal elevation of gradient, our results stand the same. This means that the genera uh, are the same across the all elevational and latitudinal gradients. So Niconians, Ficus, and Cecropia, they stand as important keystone resources no matter where you are in the Neotropics. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, uh, from Lucas Majur. Uh, it would be interesting to break this up into different forest types as well. As for instance, Miconia are not very pre prevalent in seasonally dry tropical forests across the Neotropics, whereas uh, other dry adapted taxa would be. Yes, so Lucas, in our database, we didn't have any network from tropical dry forests. You're right, uh, they are not really abundant and diverse in tropical dry forests, so we didn't have any network on tropical dry forests so that we can include this covariate. We had 38 uh, networks, 31 from wet forests and seven from uh, open ecosystems, including savannas, grasslands, wetlands. But, you know, 31 versus seven is not a, not a sample size to make comparison, statistical comparisons. But I suppose that even in, in uh, open seasonal ecosystems, they also stand as important keystone species as well. So uh, everyone is on mute now. If you want to, if you want to have a, uh, to do a question, please unmute the, the, the microphone so you can ask directly to Fernando. So. Fernando, um, great talk. Uh, I, I was wondering, so, can you somehow measure not only the number of species, but also what is the proportion? So in a given site, you have ficus, you have cecropia, you have myconia. Can you measure the biomass proportion of uh, the importance of the different groups or, or is that too complicated? That's too complicated. With the data set that we had, we didn't have, it was difficult to get enough data to do this analysis, let alone do this what that you are suggesting. I think uh, the key idea of the keystone resources implies that species have low abundance but in high effects on the ecosystem. One of the shortfalls in the, of the limitations of our study is that we don't have any data on species abundance within the community. So it might be only that we have like a myconia dominated ecosystem and then of course by chance birds and mammals would eat more meconias than you would expect. This is just a random process. But this information is really not available in the literature. But I know of uh, global initiatives which are now mapping uh, abundance within the community. So they have plots with uh, species abundance within each community. And then if you can overlap that with the fruit fruit our networks, then that would be a dream to come through to then do exactly what you're trying to you're suggesting for them. This would be a next step, really advancement. Yeah. Um, Carmen, Carmen, have a question. So. Fabia, can you mute Carmen? So. If she can now. See if she can. Carmen, can you try? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Fernando. Very nice talk. I was uh, just wondering um, 
um, all of your sites, if I remember correctly, from the first map are in the lowlands and none, none are in the high Andes, really? Is that correct? No, no, no. We have a few sites in the Andes, too. Oh, Not, okay. But we have one. I have some up to 2,500 meters above sea level. Okay. It would be interesting because Myconia can go above 3,000 meters. So, um, you know, just to see what happens up 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 there because the, the fauna of course is different up there uh, as well but yeah. really interesting thank you yes i've seen some iconia in, in the paramus in colombia almost three thousand meters yeah it was you know, really similar to miconia out because really you catch my attention it was amazing and but i couldn't see any bird eating fruits there but for sure if we the problem coming, we, we haven't found any significant effect of elevation, and this supports the idea that Miconia is important also up there in the, in the mountains. But we didn't have uh, plots established uh, along the gradients, so it would be really important to have a gradient of uh, networks along the elevation gradient. They are not evenly distributed. This would be really great to, to take a look at. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Fernando. Yes. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, Lily. Oh, Vinny. Thank you for your amazing talk. Um, I may ask a very silly question. I just want to know your opinion. If, these, if the Miconias, uh, these, um, how can I say, if the prevalence of apomixis in this um, genus can be linked to their importance or, you know, to their importance as, yes. as fruits to frugivores? Yes. Vinny, that's far from being a silly question. It's a very interesting question. I don't have an answer for that. But we can take a look at the most important tax of the most important species and I'm, I'm sure you have the database on the apocalyptic species and we can just contrast and see whether there is an effect. This would be a really nice thing to, to look at. João is here, just by your side on my screen, and he has all the database. And one thing that we want to do, people, is that we want to make all database freely available for everyone. So anyone can use and test whatever variables, whatever you want to test. So that's the purpose of the network that I want to discuss with you guys. But that's a very nice question, Vinny. We, can, we should take a look at this, or maybe you should take a look at these things. And for those who don't know me, basically no one calls me Fernando, it's Lele. So it's really strange that people call me Fernando. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Vinny. Okay. Uh, Marcel, Marcel has a question. We have to unmute you. Mm. Okay, uh, so nice talk, Fernando. Uh, I also have, a, I guess this is also a silly question. Um, isn't the, I'm really glad that my cornea is like the keystone, the top keystone, but isn't yes. that related to the size of the genus somehow? A little bias yeah. because of the size. Yeah, amazing, amazing question, Marcelo. We we also wanted Mikonia to be the first, and we were really happy to see that. And then this paper went for review in seven seven journals, and then we managed to finally publish this in Biotropica. But then reviewers criticized that, and we also uh, looked at the genus size when we compare different keystone species and we made a regression looking at the values of keystones and by the number of species in the gen in the genus and we found no significant relationship so this means that it's probably not related to the genus size as people would expect as well okay cool but this makes sense yes so yeah we found a for example, Solanum is, is larger, but it doesn't even appear. Okay. So, does anyone have more questions? Now is the time. 
Mm. Okay, so it seems mm. that uh, Marcelo wants to ask another question or is it no? Yes or no? You're yes. Good. Okay, go ahead, Marcelo. Are you listening? So I, I, I wonder uh, how are you, uh, about your database that you're trying to compile, uh, how is your, your, your approach of, on doing that? It's like literature, mining? Yes, we had to, we had some keywords and then we had to retrieve all the papers, scan the abstract to see whether there is any Nikona species in the paper and then we had to read all the, I mean, not me, but Joan, who is here. He was responsible for reading all the papers and mine all the data from the literature. So he spent months, probably a year or more doing this. And then we get everything from the literature. And when the data was not readily available, we emailed the authors, the corresponding authors. We asked for the data. They provided so we can say that we have a relatively good database for the moment but i suppose that you guys the taxonomists and specialists are the ones who have more data so that's why i want to discuss the, the database approach with you guys you know, so manually right I, I i if i understood sorry it's like manually the guy was picking manually right yes okay that was his master thesis Okay. So spent two years doing that. <laughs> so I think that's uh I'm gonna stop recording now and uh I think